them now kidnapping our family members, that's yeah. what we took a stand against. If, when it comes to protecting our family, we have to die doing it, we're going to. November 4th, 2019, the Juarez cartel eliminated three women and six children belonging to the LeBaron family. Adrian LeBaron and his family would hit back with such a force that the cartel almost collapsed. This is what happens to cartel members caught by the victim's fathers. 2014, the deadly Knights Templar cartel shot a young man dead during a shootout. That was a big mistake, as the young man's father made him regret touching his blood. Mora Chavez was a man with a gentle personality, but beneath his friendly persona was a beast. This man had the courage of a lion and a deep love for his people. He was a lime farmer and a natural leader in his town of La Duana in the state of Michoacan, Mexico. He would take charge of local vigilante groups in town and rebel against the cartel. This was a man who was feared and respected even by the Mexican government, the same government that had tried to shut down his operations many times. But Mora always came out on top. 2014, Chavez's life took a devastating turn when his son was killed during this confrontation between the Fuerza Rural Self-Defense Group and the Knights Templar Cartel, which left 11 people dead. Now this heart-wrenching loss ignited a fire within him, transforming his grief into a fierce resolve to fight back. Mora Chavez knew the only way to honor his son's memory was to stand up against the very forces that had torn his family apart. And boy, did he torment the cartel. You see, Micho Akan has been a battle ground for some of the most violent and ruthless cartels. The story of its descent into madness and the rise of these self-defense groups is actually inspiring. In the early 2000s, Micho Akan became the stronghold of the violent pseudo-religious cartel La Familia Micho Akana, led by Nazario Moreno Gonzalez, known as El Mas Loco, or the craziest one. This cartel claimed to protect people while also engaging in drug trafficking, extortion, and murder. They would terrorize the community, hosting public executions and creating their own laws. By 2011, La Familia Micho Akana had splintered, giving rise to the Knights Templar Cartel. Now this new group initially was welcomed by some locals for promises of protection, but would soon reveal their true nature. They extorted businesses, kidnapped for ransom, and brutally enforced their control over this region. The government's efforts to combat these cartels was almost non-existent, leaving the residents of Micho Akana to fend for themselves. 2013, the people of Michoacan had had enough. The tipping point came when a group of indigenous people in Cheran took up arms against illegal loggers associated with the cartels. This act of defiance inspired others, and soon we had self-defense groups, or autodefensas, starting to form across the state. Led by figures like Hipolito Mora and Dr. Jose Manuel Mireles, these groups were composed of farmers, ranchers, and just ordinary citizens who were tired of living in fear. They armed themselves with whatever weapons they could find and began to reclaim their towns from the cartels. The government really never supported them, and these self-defense groups would still manage to drive out cartel members from several areas, often engaging in fierce gun battles. So after the death of his son, Mora became this ruthless warrior against the cartels, and he ensured that they were going to feel his wrath. So intense was his fight against these gangs that the Mexican government really had no choice but to officially recognize his vigilante group and decide to incorporate them into official law enforcement. So that same year when Mora's son was murdered, these self-defense groups were legalized and integrated into the Rural Defense Corps. It was all bad news for the cartel. They were used to a corrupted government and military to cover their tracks, but now it was game over for them. As these vigilantes were now officially recognized, this also meant these vigilantes get a weapons upgrade. They formerly used hunting rifles, but with legalization, they now had access to automatic weapons like M16s. And so while Mora was gaining all these benefits, the cartel was plotting on how to eliminate him. June 29th, 2023, the streets of La Duana, Michoacan bore witness to tragedy and brutality. Chavez, the fearless leader of the auto defensas, was ambushed and assassinated by sicarios. Mora was traveling through his hometown in an SUV with his bodyguards, but they were being tracked. As his vehicle turned onto a quiet street, they would cut off his SUV and his bodyguards pickup truck, trapping him and left him no route of escape. In a coordinated assault, the gunman opened 
fire, riddling Moore's vehicle with bullets. The sound of gunfire echoing throughout the streets was a chilling reminder of the cartel's reach and power. In the chaos, Mora remained composed, just proving his bravery and resolve. He'd always known that his fight against the cartel could end in his death, and still, he never wavered in his mission to protect his community. After all was said and done, the attackers set Mora's vehicle on fire, leaving no survivors. Mora, with his three bodyguards, died in that attack, their lives cut short by the very violence they'd fought so hard to eradicate. Chavez was more than just a leader. He was a father, who had turned his tragedy into a crusade for justice. Now, The story of this next victim's father is going to make you wonder why anyone thought to murder his son. July 2000 Eduardo Gallo's life was irrevocably shattered when his 25-year-old daughter, Paula, was kidnapped from their weekend home in Tepatzlan, Mexico. However, this would be only the beginning, as things were about to get a lot worse for him, igniting a flame within Eduardo that would consume the cartel. On this fateful day, Eduardo and his family had gone on this weekend retreat at their weekend home in Tepatzlan, Mexico. The beautiful, serene atmosphere was violently disrupted when armed men would break in, robbing the house and abducting Paola. The kidnappers demanded a hefty ransom, and Eduardo, desperate to save his daughter, quickly gathered 18 $15,500 and valuable jewelry to meet their demands. It was surprising that his daughter got kidnapped in Tepatzlan, a picturesque town known for its vibrant culture and stunning landscapes. But the place had a reputation for being relatively safe compared to other parts of Mexico. However, like many areas of the country, it's not entirely immune to crime. Petty theft and occasional violent incidents do occur, but these are generally less frequent than in larger cities. The broader region of Morelos, where Tepoztlan is located, has seen its share of cartel-related violence. The state has been a battleground for various criminal organizations vying for control over lucrative routes. The CJNG is one of the most notorious groups operating in this area, known for its brutal tactics and extensive criminal activities including drug trafficking, extortion and kidnapping. The CJNG has contributed significantly to the violence in Morelos. Now, Despite his efforts, the nightmare continued. A week later, Eduardo's worst fear was confirmed when Paola's lifeless body was discovered. She'd been brutally shot in the back and neck, her final moments probably filled with terror. The pain of losing his daughter was compounded by the knowledge that her killers were still at large. Gallo's journey for justice is really a heart-wrenching tale of a father's relentless pursuit into a system riddled with corruption and inefficiency. In Mexico, justice is a rumor. Over 90% of crimes are never reported, and of those that are, only a small fraction are ever investigated. Just over 1% of all crimes committed in 2021 were resolved. That's a really poor record, showing a lack of accountability and a deep-seated corruption within the police and government. But corruption in Mexico's law enforcement and judicial systems has always been rampant. Police forces are infiltrated by criminal organizations and bribery is really commonplace. The corruption severely undermines the commitment to solving actions actual crimes and delivering justice. For many families like the Gallos, the pain of losing a loved one, mixed with the frustration of a system that fails to protect and serve its citizens, is disgusting. Now, Eduardo Gallo wasn't a man to be easily defeated. He was a very successful consultant by profession, and now he decided to shut down his firm and dedicate himself entirely in seeking justice for Paola. His transformation from grieving father to relentless vigilante was driven by this unusual yielding resolve to bring those killers to justice. His journey into the cartel's dark underworld began with meticulous research and some street-level investigations. He poured over phone records, followed his leads, and navigated the dangerous terrain of Mexico's criminal networks. Now He would find all kinds of evidence, but the police were often unresponsive or outright dismissive. But Eduardo was a fighter that really wasn't going to give up easily. Months of relentless pursuit finally did pay off. Eduardo tracked one of the kidnappers to a payphone he had used after the abduction. Now, this crucial lead allowed the police to set up a stakeout, resulting in the arrest of 28-year-old Francisco Zamora Arellano. Arellano, under the weight of undeniable evidence and Eduardo's unwavering pursuit, confessed to the crime. Eduardo's courageous actions not only brought his daughter's killer to justice, but also highlighted the pervasive issue of kidnapping and cartel violence in Mexico. And if you like that story, wait till you hear this one. 2008. 
Someone thought it was a good idea to murder the son of Manuel Torres Felix, also known as LM1, a high-ranking leader of the infamous Sinaloa cartel. And as you can guess, they soon regretted that and would pay dearly for that mistake. Manuel Torres Felix may be a heartless cartel boss, but his love and dedication for his family cannot be questioned. His life would be one of power, danger, and loyalty to his family and cartel. So when the Beltran Leva cartel brutally murdered his son, Atanasio Torres Acosta, they left LM1 totally shattered. April 2008, Atanasio was ambushed and killed in a violent attack that also injured his young daughter and sister-in-law. The news of his son's death hit LM1 like a thunderbolt. This loss pushed him to the brink of madness. The grief and rage transformed a man who was already a ruthless killer into a monster on overdrive. LM1 somehow became even more dangerous. His nickname, El Ondeado, which means the crazy one, would take on a new meaning when he embarked on his relentless quest for revenge. His rise to power was really marked by a trail of blood, resulting in extreme violence to take out rivals and enforce his will. M1's operations were meticulously planned and executed with military precision, and his influence would extend beyond the borders of Mexico. He was involved in drug trafficking, arms smuggling, and human trafficking on an international scale. He would forge alliances with other criminal organizations, creating a vast network that was nearly impossible to dismantle. His ability to evade law enforcement and rival cartels alike made him a ghost that haunted those who opposed him. So on his quest to avenge his son's death, LM1 would employ all his experience and resources to meticulously track down those responsible for his son's death. This man really had an extensive network within the cartel to get any information and plan his retribution accordingly. So the first target was a low-level member of the Beltran Leva cartel, who'd been involved in the ambush. LM1 captured that dude, brought him to his home in Culiacan. There he subjected this man to unimaginable torture, extracting any piece of information he could about the others involved. This would just be the tip of the iceberg. One by one, LM1 hunted down the perpetrators. He was merciless, often leaving bodies of his enemies in public places as a real grim warning. Sinaloa was covered in the blood of those who dared to harm his family. He was sending shockwaves through the criminal underworld, earning him a reputation as a man who would stop at nothing to avenge his loved ones. Musicians would sing the legend of LM1, the father who avenged the death of his son. The climax of LM1's vendetta would come when he faced off against a high-ranking member of the BLO, with both men determined to emerge victorious. Victorious. In the end, LM1 exacted his final revenge, bringing a brutal end to the man who had orchestrated his son's murder. M1's campaign of vengeance left an indelible mark on the Sinaloa cartel and its rivals. His actions proved the lengths a father would go to avenge his child, and they cemented his legacy as one of the most feared and respected figures in the cartel world. However, the actions of this next victim's father will leave you stunned and asking how far revenge can go. The first of two funerals for the victims of the Libera massacre. Three mothers and six children ambushed on a dirt road. The cars shot and set on fire. That's uh, exactly what we're demanding from the government. And uh, we want the truth. We want to know who did it. And we want to know why. And uh, we want them brought to justice. November 4th, 2019. The serene life of Adrian LeBaron was shattered when his daughter Maria Ronita LeBaron, along with her four children, were brutally murdered by sicarios in Sonora, Mexico. Adrian would get to work to punish this senseless act in every way possible. The LeBaron family saga in Mexico was a harrowing tale of resilience, faith, and unimaginable loss. Their story is steeped in the blood-soaked soil of northern Mexico, where the relentless grip of drug cartels has turned everyday life into a a battlefield. The family's a group of fundamentalist Mormons who migrated to Mexico in the early 20th century to escape persecution in the U.S. Alma Deir LeBaron Sr. led his family to the remote regions of Chihuahua, where they established Colonia LeBaron in 1924. This enclave was meant to be a sanctuary, a place where they could practice their faith in peace. However, the tranquility they sought for was shattered by the encroaching violence of drug cartels. November 4th, 2019. 
the most shocking and heart-wrenching chapter in the LeBaron family struggle had happened. On this fateful day, three women and six children from the extended LeBaron family were ambushed and slaughtered by Sicarios and Sonora. The family were traveling in a convoy of three SUVs en route to a wedding when these attackers, suspected to be members of La Linea, a faction of the Juarez cartel, would just unleash a hail of bullets on the vehicles. 30-year-old Renita Miller and her four children were among the first to be attacked. They lit up the car with bullets before setting it ablaze, burning them alive. In this other SUV, 43-year-old Donna Langford and her two sons, Trevor and Rogan, were also gunned down. You're probably asking, why is the cartel going after them? Well, we have to go back to the early 2000s, where the LeBaron family found themselves in the crosshairs of the cartels. Now, the region's lawlessness and the cartel's insatiable greed for control over smuggling routes would turn the LeBaron community into a target. The family was pretty wealthy, and they had a vocal stance against the cartel violence, which would make them enemies of these powerful drug lords. So by 2009, just 10 years before the Great LeBaron Massacre, the rift between this Mormon family and the cartel began when Eric LeBaron was kidnapped. The cartel would demand a million dollars for that ransom, but the family refused to bow to the cartel's demands. Instead, what they did was launch a public campaign for his release. Miraculously, Eric was freed, but the cartels weren't done with the LeBarons. July 7th, 2009, just months after Eric's release, tragedy struck again. Benjamin LeBaron, a prominent anti-crime activist and a vocal critic of cartels, was brutally murdered, along with his brother-in-law, Louis Widmar. Armed men stormed Benjamin's home, dragged him out, and executed him right in front of his family. That act of barbarity was a clear message from the cartels. Defiance would be met with death. The killings would send shockwaves throughout Mexico and the U.S. The brutality of that attack, the innocence of the victims, and the sheer senselessness of the violence would draw international condemnation. So now the surviving LeBarons, along with other residents of their community, were just left to grapple with the trauma and the ever-present threat of further violence. But the LeBarons aren't ones to roll over when they're messed with. They're fighters who understand the enemy they're dealing with. Now, Adrian LeBaron's journey for justice began with a relentless pursuit of the truth. He collaborated with local and international authorities, pushing for a thorough investigation into the massacre. His efforts weren't just about seeking retribution, but also exposing a brutal reality of cartel violence and corruption that was just allowed to flourish. The cartel responsible for all this would be the Juarez cartel. Under the command of Vicente Carillo Fuentes. They'd established a reign of terror in Chihuahua, and their operations were vast and vicious, involving drug trafficking, extortion, kidnapping, and murder. Their influence seeped into every corner of society, corrupting officials and instilling fear into the hearts of the populace. So in the area surrounding Colonia LeBaron, the cartel's presence was pretty oppressive. They controlled key smuggling routes into the U.S., using violence to maintain their grip and so the community's resistance, led by figures like Benjamin LeBaron, would be a direct threat to their dominance. The assassination of Benjamin LeBaron sparked outrage and a renewed determination to bring his killers to justice. The LeBaron family, along with other activists, launched a relentless campaign to hold the cartel accountable. They would face death threats on a daily basis, but their resolve never wavered. Years of legal pressure, investigative journalism, would begin to chip away at the cartel's impunity. The Mexican government government, under increasing scrutiny, intensified its efforts to dismantle the Juarez cartel. Joint operations would disrupt the cartel's power, but the elusive leaders remained at large. In a dramatic turn of events, this relentless pursuit of justice resulted in the arrest of Vicente Carillo Fuentes. They would also arrest El Raquin and his gang, who were hitmen for the cartel. They were the ones who assassinated Benjamin LeBaron. The arrest was a huge blow to the Juarez cartel, and it only made the battle between the cartel and LeBaron's even worse. That's what led to the murder of Adrian LeBaron's daughter, as the cartel sought revenge as well. But Adrian and the family realized they couldn't continue to rely on the Mexican government for protection anymore. So the family began to change tactics. The LeBarons had armed themselves and established roadblocks and checkpoints within their community. They thought these measures would disrupt the cartel's operations and protect their loved ones from further harm. The cartel began to get frustrated as the family sent a powerful message of defiance and resilience. 
The LeBaron's efforts are part of a broader movement to reclaim their safety and autonomy, and by taking up arms and setting up these defensive measures, they actively challenged the cartel's influence, asserting their right to live without fear. Them now kidnapping our family members, that's what we took a stand against. If, when it comes to protecting our family, we have to die doing it, we're going to. Surprisingly, the Mexican government took a firm stance against vigilante movements, denouncing the formation of these armed self-defense groups. It would be President Andres Manuel López Obrador who would emphasize that such groups were unacceptable, as security should be the responsibility of the state. However, the reality on the ground tells us a completely different story. People like the LeBaron family, who have endured significant losses at the hands of cartels, feel compelled to take matters into their own hands. And as a result, the LeBarons found a way to legally arm themselves by establishing shooting clubs. This clever workaround allows them to own firearms without facing charges of illegal possession. And if you thought the LeBaron's case was shocking, this next one will make you question why someone even dared to harm the son of one of the most feared drug lords. It's May 2008, and the eldest of Joaquin El Chapo Guzman's sons, Edgar Guzman Lopez, was brutally gunned down in a parking lot by a group of 40 Sicarios. Now the news Edgar's death transformed El Chapo from a monster to the devil himself, as he would brutally avenge his son's death. May 8th, 2008, Edgar and his bodyguards were driving in the city in a convoy of SUVs. They pretty much owned the city and had nothing to fear, not even the government. He pulls up to the parking lot of a shopping center at the Desarrollo Urbano Tres Rios neighborhood, which would be a place that was safe enough, even for someone of Edgar's stature. But unknown to Edgar, a group of around 40 hitmen from the rival BLO cartel lay in wait. The ambush was meticulously planned, the gunmen knowing exactly when and where to strike. When Edgar and his men stepped out of their vehicles, the sound of gunfire erupted in the air. Obviously, Edgar and his bodyguards were outgunned and outnumbered, and shortly after, Edgar died from his wounds, being hit by several bullets. El Chapo was never anybody you'd want to mess with. He's somebody who was simply pure evil. For most of his life, El Chapo was killing and butchering people in the most horrific ways. So it was therefore a shock that anyone would think it'd be a great idea to kill his beloved son. Chapo had no problem killing thousands of people, including women and children, but his love for his sons was as good as that of any good father. The death of his son was a personal attack, and he vowed to make those responsible pay dearly. He called up the most trusted lieutenants, mobilizing the full might of the Sinaloa cartel. It wasn't just about revenge. He was going to send a message that no one messes with his family and lives to talk about it. El Chapo's intelligence team quickly found the perps. They were members of a rival cartel emboldened by the belief that they could strike at the heart of the Sinaloa cartel without repercussions. They were wrong. El Chapo's response was swift and brutal. He deployed his sicarios, the sickest elite assassins trained to kill without hesitation, to hunt down every last one of these hitmen involved in Edgar's murder. 2008, the streets of Cuyacan turned into a battlefield. El Chapo's men were armed with high-powered rifles and grenades, launching a series of coordinated attacks on their rival strongholds. Buildings were reduced to rubble, the air was thick with the sound of gunfire and explosions, and that virus would spread to Mexico City, where two police officers were killed. Now Cuyacan saw 116 murders, 24 of them police, and nationwide the country registered 493 drug-related deaths. Uh, the rival cartel, caught off guard by the ferocity of this assault had a hard time defending themselves. The climax of this bloody vendetta came when El Chapo himself led this assault on the rival's leader. Chapo and his boys would storm the heavily fortified compound where the leader was hiding. It was intense, bullets flying in every direction, but El Chapo, driven by the memory of his son, was taking him out left and right. He personally executed the BLO leader, making sure that the man who took out his son would never harm anyone again. 